by sa mi to lásať. Ale sa je kapo vôbec Robert Cicit, čo je šaršen dávny svet. Tak môj sa interesuje séria, ale sa schváda svoj potom je vysiel čierny, tu sa ťažia o organizácie, ktoré sa môj vyrobí. Bude tu mrebe na grovu množstve čítať, schváda svoj aktuálnu, tu sa interesuje téme pze, a tá rebe sa ťažia o lekcie pze. Sámi sa rdára kebúte na kávši rebe, tko onda patára čoveta, tá je chvára rádiám čo je stávala. Այսվով Սա ինդերեսով տեմազ է իսավովրեպս դեմուկրատի շետուր կամոց դիլ է բասանակալ չլի մի իսավովրեպս կերտ ու տալվատույթոն ու է տետալեպսույթոն գետույս կավոտոն դիյասը ուրի ու դես իտպիտ սամ սիտխոտ � Անալիզիս ծենց անդակավջիրեմիտի։ Հավալ պրոյկտան նրթած արիս իսրոմ մովածգոտ սաճարո լեկցիևի ագրարու ունիվերսիտետան թանամշրոմ լոբիտ, ռոգործ լաշան թվականու ախլի տարդատեք է վիշեմ դեկ դա բիրուելի ստումարի խավս շվետեցի սելչի, շեմ դեկ իրաշի գորքնեպա Սաճարո լեկցիա, Սատաց իսա ուբրեմ Սապրանգետի սելչի դա Սակ մաղոց հայ ինտերեսով թեմա գորքնեպա, Սաղխանդրիպվուվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվ
start a bit with geography. Sweden is, uh, is quite a, uh, in, in scope, it's a big country. It's the third biggest in Europe, uh, almost as big as uh, Spain or France, and bigger than California in the US. And it's, it's very long, it's 1,574 kilometers long, which is like from Berlin to Moscow, if that says more. But, but most of the people live in the south. That's where we have the three, 90% of the people live in the south of the country. So there, are, just like in Georgia, there are, are, are large parts of the country that is uh, not at all uh, densely populated. On the contrary, very sparsely populated. We have in, in, uh, some 22 inhabitants per square kilometers. In all, we're 9.2 million people. So it's twice the size of Georgia, more or less. Um, and uh, I think there is another similarity. I mean, a uh, hundred years ago, at least, we had uh, a lot of emigrants. People left, uh, one and a half million Swedes left for the US because uh, the economic circumstances were so harsh in Sweden at the time. Um, yeah, I said we are... Uh, Today Sweden is a rich and well-educated country with the large annual investments made in education and research. We are become a multicultural country in the last 50 years uh, due to a lot of uh, immigrants. Uh, people have come as refugees or for other reasons. And uh, today almost one-fifth of the 9.2 million are born abroad or have parents born abroad. Sweden has a very violent history. Uh, a lot of people have heard about the Vikings, not only in the um, editorial stuff of The Economist. Uh, it, we have a history filled of war and conquest. And in the 16th century, Sweden was a great power in Europe, uh, controlling territories almost all around the Baltic Sea. But, uh, well, it, it, this war tradition, I would say, started with the Vikings and then sort of carried on with warrior kings like uh, Gustav II, Adolf, and Karl XII. And by, by the time, by the 18th century, all these wars had completely ruined the Swedish economy. And since then we have had a more peaceful um, tradition. We sort of had to, to do it. Um, we were so impoverished by all the fighting. And now we have been at peace for almost 200 years. We have not had war in Sweden. Since 1814, and we're one of the few European countries that uh, were not involved in the Second World War, or in the, in the two World Wars. Sweden is a monarchy, but it is a, a constitutional monarchy. So the, the king is the head of state, but has no political power. Uh, he has only representative and ceremonial functions. Uh, the current king of Sweden, called the success of Gustav, he's been in the throne since 1973. The woman to the right you see on the slide is the crown princess, Princess Victoria. She uh, uh, married uh, recently with her, and this is really a fairy tale I would say, she married with her previous personal trainer, who's now Prince Daniel. And they also got a daughter just last year. Um, the political power rests with the, the um, parliament and the, the government. Sweden has a one-chamber parliament, the Riksdag, with 349 members, which is quite a big parliament, but it has largely to do with uh, the country being big and scarcely scar populated. And we have two political blocks. Um, I want to say it. Uh, it's, we have the alliance, which is now in, in power, uh, consisting of the moderate party, the liberal party, the center party, and the Christian Democrats. And then we have the, the other side, the social democrats, the left party, and the green party. And now, actually we have eight parties now, when I come to think about it, after the last uh, general elections, eight parties we have, uh, because the Sweden Democrats have entered the, the parliament, which is... Um, which is the first time in a long time we have a new party entering the uh, parliament. The dominant party in Sweden has almost always been the Social Democrats. Uh, they governed the country most through the decades, uh, since the 1920s, 
However, since September 2006, we have this alliance, which is a center-right alliance in power. And I think it was the first time a center-right alliance managed to actually stay in power over a general election. I mean, two consecutive periods uh, ever in, in Swedish history. So this uh, sort of uh, domination by the Social Democratic Party has, has been broken. Um, the country's current prime minister and the leader of this World Party Alliance in, in government is uh, Fredrik Reinfeldt. He's, uh, he's also the party leader of the Moderates Party. Sweden is a member of the European Union since 1995, and this has changed a lot for us, in both uh, domestically and, and foreign policy-wise. Uh, we had a referendum on the uh, membership. Uh, I think it was in 1994, Then we had another one on the Euro, and then Sweden decided to stay outside the Euro. So we were one of three countries. Uh, no, more. I mean, the, the, the Brits and the Danes and we are all outside the Eurozone. So we, I mean, economically and formally, we, we could become members. Um, the economy is, of course, of, of huge interest. Uh, as I said, at the end of the 19th century, Sweden was really a poor country, uh, largely uh, with... Um, it, it was one of the poorest countries in Europe, actually. But that changed with industrialization. Uh, and during the next 50 years, Sweden became one of the richest countries in the world. A record economic development took place. And it was strongly connected to infrastructure projects, such as building railways, allowing access to natural resources, uh, forests, iron ore, hydropower are the three pillars. And I would say it's still pretty much the backbone of, of, of Swedish economy. And it's considered the traditional basis of the Swedish economy. And this, these, this period, these 50 years, when Sweden really transformed from a peasant country to an industrialized nation was, uh, is often described as a Swedish economic miracle. And we have now one of the highest gross domestic products per capita in the world. Uh, trade has been a, always very important, Sweden being a, having a small domestic market. Uh, and a surprisingly large number of multinational export companies and brands have their origin in Sweden. Uh, Volvo, AstraZeneca, ABB, IKEA, Ericsson, Electrolux, H&M, Saab, Absolute Vodka, these are all Swedish brands. And I think that's quite remarkable given the size of our country. Uh, today most import uh, the most important export goods are electronics and telecom equipment, machinery, passenger cars, paper, pharmaceuticals, iron and steel. And as I said, the, the steel and the paper production uh, is still pretty much the backbone. Uh, it still costs, uh, account for one-fifth of the total export income. So it's very, very important. We try to innovate though. Uh, so, uh, the knowledge intensive industries and such as IT, biotechnology, biomedicine, environmental friendly technologies has really um, advanced uh, the last decade or so. So has the creative industries, design, fashion, music, gastronomy, uh, they are also up and coming. And I, know, I guess you heard of a lot of Swedish and uh, it's not only ABBA any longer, it's uh, anything from Swedish House Mafia to Ace of Base and, and uh, what, was, um, what was the winner of the European Missions of Contest? Um, that was also Laureen. Yeah. So this, um, we are very strong in, in music. Tourism has also boomed. Uh, it's increased greatly over the past two decades and the industry, the tourism industry now accounts for some 88 billion Swedish krona, 
which is more actually than the value of the, the, the car industry previously. Um, security is, or s let me talk a bit about society, uh, because that's what people come to think of uh, Sweden being a welfare state. Uh, and the ground pillar of that welfare state is that every citizen, regardless of background, income, etc., should be guaranteed basic security uh, in every phase of life. So we have high taxes uh, that pay for large public sector and finance general welfare systems like healthcare, schooling, senior care, etc. Uh, so, and we also, I would add, have a, a strong redistribution uh, policy. And this is what is often referred to the Swedish model, or the middle way. I should also mention environment and sustainability, since this is really something that uh, engages a lot of Swedes. I think it's partly connected to our love for nature, and that many Swedes live very close to the nature. Um, so Swedish companies are now very innovative in terms of uh, finding new technologies to keep a society going without too much of an environmental uh, impact. And um, I dare to say that Swedes live very uh, sustainably, if I may say so. When here it really hurts my heart when I pour everything in the trash, like batteries, light bulbs, everything. There is no no sort of um, waste, uh, what do you call it, um, recycling. So in, in Sweden we would, like each citizen would go and recycle and divide it up, uh, glass there, paper there, etc, etc. And then the rest that is there is burnt uh, for heating, since we live in a cold climate. Where people also uh, interested in what they eat in terms of the uh, organic food, that's an industry on, on the rise, and many drive green cars, and uh, the, the demand for that is on the rise. Here in, uh, in Georgia it feels a bit alien, uh, and I noticed that we, the embassy here and CEDA, the Swedish Development um, Agency is working in the environmental sector here, and it's. Uh, I uh, I think there is a lot to, to do, really, and and there, it's not as complicated as it may seem every time. Uh, to, for instance, to recycle. Another ground pillar in the Swedish model is equality. Uh, and it's not only equality between sex sexes, but really we have a strong we have strong laws, strong legislation, but also customs uh, that prohibit discrimination against people on sex or ethnic origins or, or sexual orientation or physical disabilities or what it might be. Um, and we ranked top three in the gender gap. I think this is really also crucial to understand our economic uh, progress. It's a lot of economists have been counting on how much inequality between inequality actually costs society in terms of keeping people not uh, prohibiting or hindering people to really um, develop to their full potential. Um, and we also have a, a social welfare system that makes it easier to combine work and, and family. So 79% of our women in Sweden are gainfully employed. And that is uh, much above the European average of 56%. And I think it's also noteworthy that the Swedish government has more, I think we have more female ministers than male and the parliament uh, consists of some 40 plus percent uh, women parliamentarians. Educa uh, that was equality. Yeah, I should say also that a lot of men in Sweden take parental leave. 
and we have a general system for parental leave, uh, maternity leave, but uh, not everything is maternity leave. Actually, there is one month that is earmarked for for the father to to stay at home, and if it doesn't want to, then you don't get that month of parental leave. That's quite uh, progressive, I think. Though in Sweden we have a debate on how whether or not the, this. Like the, the entire amount of days you get uh, for parental leave should be divided equal between the, the mother and the father. Education is uh, key. Uh, education, we have nine years of, uh, of uh, compulsory schooling, uh, which is free. We have high school, which is free of charge as well. And, uh, 98% of students who finish compulsory school starts high school. And uh, we also spend a lot on um, uh, higher education and research. Roughly 25% of the students who attend high school programs continue to university or university college. And uh, again, that is also almost free of charge and you can get a grant as a student so you can cover or you get a grant and a loan the grant will cover some parts of your living expenses and the loan the rest uh, and then you pay back and i could say most end up with quite big loans because you, you need to study for some four or five years and it takes decades to pay it back but I tend to look at it as a, a sort of a, a um, education tax that's extra for for actually being able to go to to university. Innovations. I spoke about our industries earlier. Uh, I want to mention um, some. I think this research feeding. Uh, there is a close link, I should say, between university and and research. Um, and that has resulted in a number of successful in inventions. And I want to give a few examples because uh, I think it's quite, again, quite noteworthy that Sweden has come up with so many good ideas. So, uh, how many of you knew that the computer mou mouse is actually a Swedish uh, invention? Or that Bluetooth for internet mobility, or the pacemaker, or the AXA telephone exchange, the Tetra Pak beverage um, packing system, the dialysis machine, uh, and this um, and that it was a Swedish. There was um, Lars Magnus Eriksson who, in 1881, a Swede, invented the telephone. Not, not the telephone, but he released the first telephone handset to the market. And uh, four years later, that continued to, to develop into what would be uh, the mobile phone. And still t today, Ericsson is really a, a um, global player when it comes to mobile telephony globally. Other Swedish inventions, the Celsius thermometer, the safety match, the ship propeller, dynamite, the cream separator, the adjustable wrench, which is what you see on this picture, the ball bearing, the unmanned lighthouse, and the steam turbine. I think it's quite uh, remarkable, actually. Uh, we didn't get all this without a lot of work, <laughs> and but I would say that working in Sweden is is uh, quite, uh, uh, what to say, I think there is much more of a casual atmosphere in, in Swedish work life than you find in many other uh, places. Most people would go directly to, to their boss with whatever they have on their mind. Um, and uh, now I've lost my script here somewhere, so if you give me two seconds, I will organize myself.
yeah, we we had a reform actually a few uh, it was already a few decades ago when we turned to saying like putting away the titles and said uh, saying uh, like you to everyone you would shun everyone in Sweden you would very 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 rarely call anyone schön and that's just uh, how it is so uh, uh, it's it's very little hierarchy in companies and. Uh, and Swedish workers tend to rely heavily on compromise. We want everyone to be on board with whatever decision um, that are, uh, is, is taken. And uh, policies and, and ideas are often openly discussed all, across all levels before any decisions are taken. And I think that's really stunning. Uh, being an outsider watching children culture, not children political culture, not the least, um, which I find is quite the opposite to uh, uh, consensus building. It's, it's very polarized. Um, I should say also that 70% of those who work are employed in the private sector and around 30% in the public sector. But the public sector accounts for almost a bit more than half of, of uh, GDP. Though it's the, the public sector has uh, shrunk uh, the last years, it's it's still it's still big. So I think actually I uh, I stop there uh, and uh, leave the floor open to questions. And I hope that this presentation has given you an idea on what Sweden looks like and how we actually got to where we are. Uh, thank you. Question, Who wants to start? You mentioned, you both mentioned, please, please separate. Yeah. Beekeeping. Oh, okay. No, no, queen, queen separator. It's Anfa, it's Anfa who, when you have milk, yeah, 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 of course you know. It's agriculture. Yes. Agri and, uh, we name also it as Hanneman separator. Hanneman was a uh, Swedish man? Or no, you don't know it. Mm, I don't know. No, I don't think. Anyway, it's Swedish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question about the educational opportunities uh -huh. for Georgians in Sweden, whether there are any exchange programs that would benefit our students, especially I'm, I'm asking about short-term practicum mm. or, or such. Uh, I know uh, that there are some Georgians going to study in Sweden. Unfortunately, it is not any longer free of charge that it used to be, but there are some programs for grants. I think it's easier, uh, and a lot of education lately has started also to uh, appear in English, but uh, the main language would otherwise be Swedish, which would be a sort of barrier. But there are more and more edu um, programs that run also in, in English. When it comes to shorter programs, there are also such. We usually we have uh, with CETA uh, uh, the, a lot of short-term programs for experts in various fields. And those programs, when they, they are open for Georgian applicants, we, page, uh, we post them on our website. Um, and we also usually send it out to institutions that might have uh, uh, relevant applicants in their staff or in their school for that matter. But uh, the best would actually be to check into the Swedish Institute website and read about, or any university like uh, take Uppsala or Stockholm University and see what is written there, what applies for, for children. Europe, 
And uh, I want to ask you that you mentioned you also the private sector. Mm -hmm. And do you agree that the developing private sector really helps country to be more developed? And uh, is there any huge difference between people working in public sector and private sector? And does people think that private sector <laughs> is really good for them? Because, uh, you know, uh, here maybe there's really huge difference. Mm. Uh, the people working in private sector, they really feel themselves more be much better rather in public sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you agree that private sector really means a lot for country to be developed? Yeah, I agree completely. The private sector means a lot for the country uh, economically, also because uh, I mean. The larger part of the economy stems from the private sector, and that's that's a key driving factor. And I can't really tell. I've been a public servant myself my whole life, so I can't. I don't even know how it feels to be in the private sector. But I, I don't. I mean, when it comes to uh, work security related or salaries, it's not a huge difference. It depends on, of course, if you're in banking, you would earn a lot more. Or if you're a CEO, you would earn a lot more than if you're heading an agency or the equivalent in, in the state organizations. State salaries are, are much lower because we're paid by taxpayers' money. It, I, I, think I find it quite normal yeah, to be. But yes, sorry? Communication. Is it different uh, in the public uh, and in the private sector? Oh, you mean in terms of uh, yeah. how people. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. that you're talking to yeah. people like. You no, very, uh, no. Equality is very wide, so. no, I would argue that it's uh, more or less the same. Yeah. It's more or less the same in both uh, the public and, and the... Yeah, I think it has something to do with our mind. There is this... Uh, yeah, it is, it is the same. I think it might be slightly different in... in private companies that are part of um, an international consortium. If you work for McKinsey, it might be different, I don't know, because you have an international culture that you also have to relate to. But the Swedish work culture, I would say, is, is the same. I mean, basically, the only person I wouldn't say shen to is the king and the royal family. So. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you for visiting us. So we learned that some of the uh, companies which were supposed to be part of the Swedish identity so are being purchased by, mm -hmm. by foreign companies and uh, uh, one of the big brands is now China owned. So yeah, we know mm -hmm. this debate is yeah. in Georgia, so, I mean, uh, but how, how does I mean, uh, general public in uh, Sweden perceive this? Yeah, I think it's uh, different, and I think there is an ideological uh, pattern in that, partly, I would guess. I mean, we would love to see, I would love to see Volvo staying Swedish, but if someone else, if we can't run the company, or if it, if the alternative would be bankruptcy, then why, why not, if someone else can, can run it profitably better, then, then be it. That's my sort of take on it. I think uh, there is a part, there is a division, we had a, debate on whether the state should actually intervene and try to support these companies. But th this government decided it shouldn't. Uh, also based on experience trying to save our shipping industry in the 60s, which costed us billions and in the end uh, we lost it anyhow. Uh, if it's not profitable, it's not profitable. Um, and it's few, I think, few, few cases where you can show that the state is better in running enterprises than the private sector. Uh, but I, I think it's a bit of an ideological divide how people look at this. But these are private companies, these aren't state companies. So if they want to sell it, 
these aren't strategic assets that are prohibited by law or something like that to be sold, so they were sold. And, and we have to come up with new things instead, like Spotify, which is also Swedish. You mentioned that about 20% of the population is either immigrant or children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the ethos uh, in which everyone embraces a great deal of welfare state and redistribution. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you comment on what kinds of pressures uh, that creates in terms of the, the ethos, and especially if there's now data that... If there's, no if there's now any data yeah. indicating alarming trends mm -hmm. in terms of the next generation uh, continuing to be uh, among immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. Disproportionately recipients of redistribution. Mm -hmm. If there's a trend like that, then one would expect maybe some tensions in terms of that uh, ethos. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's uh, friction free, uh, but uh, I would stress that Sweden is, is very much dependent on, on uh, an inflow of uh, immigrants to to stay prosperous and uh, to keep the economic wheels going. Uh, there, there, I mean, there are problems. There are social problems. There are economic problems. There are integration problems. Absolutely, but this, I think, is for us to deal with rather than closing the door. There are, like in any countries, the voices that are against immigration and that would only underline the tensions or the problems, and there are those, and luckily those in, in power, that would argue that this is actually beneficial for, for Sweden, and that we need to work with solving the problems. Uh, there, I would argue that most of the immigrants adapt and integrate really well, and I don't really have any figures on this redistribution, um, but it has changed over time. In terms of, it's not as easy to, to just get part of the uh, government's uh, redistribution schemes as it used to be. And that's part of the modernization of the welfare state in us, for us in order to be able to actually um, afford it also for the future. So it isn't that easy any longer. And I think we have a lot of incitements that really encourage people to, to work instead. And also, I think the labor market has partly opened up also for um, people that do not necessarily yet speak fluent Swedish or have other requirements for for the labor market. So that has also changed. And, and also, w with legislation allowing immigrants to work even before they have uh, uh, they have the residence permit uh, decided that has also been discussed as one way of, of, of keeping people active and in the labor force I don't know if that was an answer to your question I hope so Thank you. any more questions Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question about this NGO Kuna to Kuna? And can you tell us a little bit about the history? Because apparently there's a very strong institution which has branches around the world. And I'm mm. wondering how did it come about to develop as a strong institution? And what, what are some of the goals that you pursued? I have to admit that I don't really know their story. I mean, I know they work here, and I know they're they're one of the bigger Swedish NGOs, and they are very much into grassroots work on with women. Kvinnat kvinna means uh, women, woman to woman, in Swedish. Uh, so they focused on strengthening women's role in in uh, in the work life, in society, in the communities. And uh, and also uh, empowering them politically. But I and and they work in a lot of different countries. 
how it came about, I don't know. But I can say in general, we have a strong, we have a strong women's movement in, in Sweden. It started with a movement that made sure we got um, uh, the right to vote, which we got in 1918. And then uh, I think women, I guess it's also part of the sort of consensus mindset we have that women try to uh, work together regardless of ideological differences in, in questions and issues that unite them. Just as, as women, or, or identify those questions that do unite them, where they can join forces and thereby pu push their agenda. That we see, for instance, in Parliament, where you, uh, more so earlier, I think, because now the legislation we have in place is, is very, um, how to say, sensitive to gender inequalities, but earlier uh, in Parliament you saw a lot of uh, collaboration from women parliamentarians in different parties in order to push legislation on, for instance, um, take care for children or issues that were more, they felt were more relevant to them. So I guess it stems from, from that movement spreading spreading its wings over the world, but I, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of ministers, uh, there are women, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I have the numbers here somewhere, I get them for you. Yeah. And uh, uh, what do you think, is there any reason what's causing, or it just happens that there are men? I, uh, no, it didn't just happen. We had a long debate about uh, whether one should have quotas for women in order to strengthen their role in politics. And then uh, the parties them themselves uh, sort of uh, saw how this would strengthen their case uh, and strengthen their voter space among women voters if they were really promoting these issues. Uh, so I know a few elections ago, uh, most parties would come up with uh, the idea of having every second name on the party list as a woman. And that was their own initiative in order to, uh, well, both because they believed in it, I guess, but also to, to attract uh, women voters. Uh, I, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, I think what's important is that you have some sort of a equality. It doesn't it doesn't need to be 50-50 if you ask me, but but if you have a situation where you have 90% men and 10% women or the vice versa, I don't think you really get a good climate and I don't think you really manage to uh, sort of grasp uh, the needs of an entire society. I just don't think so. I think it's, it's you get better decision making if it's sort of, and a better atmosphere also, I think, if, if it's more or less equal. Uh, and as I said, also economists nowadays show, yeah, we have 23 ministers, uh, of which 13 are women. Yeah. Uh, now I lost where I was talking about. Um, yeah, never mind. Well, it's very nice that the country shows up, but the, uh, in government, more women. Uh, the, in government, there can be women, yeah. and if this country could be very strong, yeah. and I think it's a very good example. Thank you. More I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think what we have uh, the most uh, of inequality is in business life still. If you look at the uh, executive boards of big companies, they are uh, still heavily dominated by men, and this is something that is debated in Sweden, whether one should uh, push companies to have quotas, which is the companies themselves are heavily resisting, but that at least that process is encouraging them to um, uh, find more women, suitable women candidates. So it has, a, it's a sort of a self, I wouldn't say self-censorship, but once a, when, once a politician starts threatening with action that they themselves respond to it in order to, to not have this uh, pushed on them from, from the top. 
Any more questions? One question. <coughs> more. The, one of the last uh, cover pages of The Economist mm -hmm. magazine was the next supermodel yeah. anti-Tosin. It comes from Scandinavia. And it was a uh, special. There it is. Yeah, special. Uh, I missed it. Yeah. A special edition, so how uh, the uh, welfare state, mm -hmm. uh, as it was known to the world of the 70s and yeah. so on, has been transformed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how, how do people perceive this? So, it's something, I mean, with. Is a short-term project or response to the crisis, or it is an ordinary flow of events that there was some, in some stage and that, that and maybe an also follow-up question or mm -hmm. combination of two questions. Uh, and this is one question. Uh, so, short-term project or just I mean response mm -hmm. to new realities. And second is, it's also a little bit related maybe to political life. So how was it possible uh, to have uh, one party in power for a few decades? Yeah. In, because there's still to be a model democracy. So mm -hmm. how this balance of I mean, political power and debate and pluralism was maintained mm -hmm. under this Oh, the second one is a really tough question. Well, if I start with the, the modernization of the welfare state, I think it's a, an endless project. I mean, I think it's something that has to be done over and over again. Like any company needs to innovate all the time and find smarter, better ways to do things. I think the state has to work the same way. For us, it, it was... A, it was partly ideolo uh, ideological, but it was also driven by economic needs in order to be able to finance the welfare state for an aging population, for instance, with free health care. When people live longer and health care get more and more advanced and cost more and more, how, how do we support that? With uh, emigra uh, immigration, how do we fund that? I mean, we want to keep the door open, but how do we actually finance that? So I think it was driven by both. And when it comes to the, this current financial crisis, touch wood, we've been doing quite fine during the crisis. Partly because we had our own banking crisis in the beginning of the 90s, where we learned our lessons on balancing our sheets. Uh, and, and now for this crisis, we have been, I mean, we have been affected, of course, with uh, since we we're so export dependent and export driven our economy and once the demand is gone I mean it affects our our business but but still we've been managing to adapt or switch companies have um, so I think it's it's uh, it's part uh, what's interesting is that this modernization of the welfare state and that's also something the economist article sort of highlights is that it's it's an agenda driven by the center right because and that I think is is because the sort of the concept of the welfare state is not really something well I would say not there's a very few people questioning this as our model I mean there are very few people that would like to see a completely liberal sort of or American type of system there's this welfare the idea of the welfare state is so embedded in Sweden, so no one can really challenge it and, and so get elected. It's a clear necessity. It is a necessity. It's a, it's a political reality. Uh, but, but of course there is an ideological uh, divide there as well. For instance, this uh, center-right government has been pushing private schools, uh, private hospitals, and that is, uh, for the, the left, uh, uh, difficult to accept. And if, if you would have, well, it depends on who in the left that would get to power, we might see a reverse in that. But, the, the, but that is sort of remodeling the welfare state rather than questioning it as such. 
Uh, and then there was a very difficult second question on social democratic. Yeah, power. how they could keep in yeah. power for so long being so dominant and still Sweden being a democratic uh, Yeah. yeah. No. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really unique in the way that the Social Democratic Party uh, dominated Swedish politics for decades. I think partly maybe also because uh, they were often a minority government, dependent on support from what they, they would get from the Communist Party, which is not a left party. Uh, that was never had a portfolio in the government, but were always supportive. I think that created some sort of um, uh, uh, counterbalance. They would also sometimes in issues find uh, other parties to work with. And, and again, it's this consensus driven, uh, this wish to find consensus. If you can find a broader solution, it's always better. You might not get everything you want, but at least you know it would last for for longer time. For instance, when we had um, a new uh, new agreement on uh, pensions, that was uh, that was not something that the the government in in power at the time would push on its own. It would seek a broad consensus in order for this pension reform to, to be able to uh, live on for decades, even over power changes, which is necessary because pension is such a huge question and you can't change it from, from one government to the other. You need something that is that is there for, for decades. But, uh, but I, uh, I don't know, I can't explain it better and I, I just don't know how it, how, how, how they managed to stay in power for so long and how we actually managed to, to keep it up the way the, 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 the vibrant democracy at the same time. Any more questions? I think that maybe the light went out in order for me to stop speaking. <laughs> Our question is the end of the